the Advisory Consortium on Conflict Sensitivity, which is a tripartite arrangement between Refugee Law Project, International Alert, and Safer World, organized a three days national reconciliation conference from March 15th to 18th, 2015, at Speak Resort Munyonyo Kampala. The conference brought together over 350 key stakeholders political party leaders, cultural leaders, religious leaders, opinion leaders, civil society actors, government and non-government actors, victims or survivor groups from across the country. It reflected on key findings of the first ever compendium of conflicts in Uganda. The conference provided a forum for key stakeholders to critically discuss how conflicts and their unaddressed legacies in different parts of the country continue to impede nation building and sustainable peace building in Uganda. Day one of the conference was centered around discussing Uganda today and the emerging conflict drivers. Welcome to this National Reconciliation Conference 2015. We can look at our past, our present, and probably forge a better future for the country that we so much love. Our chief guest, none other than His Lordship Justice James Sogola. He is a very unique chief guest to open this conference because for those of you who remember the Juba Peace Talks, he was the first national chairman for the National Transitional Justice Working Group that proceeded to begin implementing the Juba <laughs> Peace agreements. <laughs> you are welcome, sir. Countrymen, friends, we are going to say a word or two about national reconciliation. John the Baptist sent his disciples, two of them, to interrogate the status and the standing of Jesus Christ. Was he the promised Messiah, or are we to wait for another, they asked. After answering his interlocutors, Jesus in turn put his own questions to his disciples and listeners, the multitudes. Why did they go to the wilderness to see John the Baptist. What did they expect to see? A reed blown by the whims of the winds? A prince bedecked or begowned in fine linen? A prophet or what? We too Seeing what we've seen, the inexhaustively long catalog of Uganda's rebellions, insurrections, coups d'etat, campaigns of violence, and war, having seen and experienced all these, we too would be entitled to ask as Jesus did 2,000 years ago. What do the perpetrators of these rebellions seek to accomplish? What underlying principles and philosophies do they, are they driven by? Is it their intent to end violence with violence, is it their purpose to establish in the communities peace through war in the bushes? Is it their plan to beget sanity, equanimity, and tranquility through the reckless insanity of terror and tumult? Obote one succumbed to the coup of Idi Amin. Amin fell to the ferocious Saba Saba gunship men of the Tanzanian-led war 
of liberation. Yusuf Lule was involuntarily shipped off to the safe house of Dar es Salaam's state house, leaving behind a legacy of the shortest stint at the presidency of Uganda. The dead of Uganda will continue to have died in vain until us, the living, resolve to heal the wounds of the nation. I declare the conference officially open. The Advisory Consortium on Conflict Sensitivity was established in 2010 with funding support from DFID to assist DFID and other partners in strengthening the potential of the Peace Recovery and Development Program to address the causes of conflict in ways that are conflict sensitive and that could contribute to sustainable peace and stability. Two years later, in 2012, we combined our experience and data collected in the course of the first two years to develop a comprehensive peace and conflict analysis of northern Uganda. And I'm pleased to say that in those rather splendid folders that you have, there is a copy of that analysis. Following a, a national reconciliation and transitional justice audit, which Refugee Law Project conducted nationwide in 2012 and 2013, we finally were able to combine, compile the findings into this compendium, what we're calling a compendium of conflicts in Uganda, 2014. We're hoping that this compendium and the discussions it generates will help build the momentum for a process over which ordinary citizens have ownership and which results in a country to which they feel they belong and from which they derive a strong sense of common identity. Just to start by explaining a little bit about DFID and the project, um, my organisation is, is the Department for International Development, which is the UK government's aid agency. Um, and that, that department has provided something like £4 million, which is about 18 billion shillings, to the Advisory Consortium on Conflict Sensitivity over the lifespan of the programme. Um, and that was part of a broader commitment that we made uh, of £100 million for a programme on post-conflict development for northern Uganda as our contribution to the work around recovery in northern Uganda after the end of the LRA conflict. And DFID uh, really does place quite a strong emphasis on conflict wherever it works around the world. I think for me, having worked on conflict and fragile states for, for 15 or so years, the key lesson is not to take peace for granted and to recognize that post-conflict is fragile and recovery doesn't come overnight. Context and history are complex. Different things matter to different people and different people will remember the causes of conflicts in different ways. Too often, we want to generalize about what we know. It's about land, it's about unemployment, it's about gender relations. But the best recovery programs are built on a thorough understanding of the different perspectives, different people, different regions, genders, age groups, which can lead to much more tailored interventions. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. I would like to go straight to the areas that we have covered in our sample sites. In the severely affected regions of Acholi and Karamoje, we picked Gulu, Amuru, Kirgum, and Lamo, and also Karamoja, we picked Abi, Moroto, and Kotido. The sporadically affected area of Lango and the West Nile, Otuke and um, Lira, are from Lango and from West Nile, Ajumani, Yumbe, Aru, and Zombo. And the spillover, we focus in the Bukedi region, Tororo, from Bunyoro, Kiriadongo, Elgon, Mbale, and uh, from Teso, Soroti, and Amuria. And our control districts were Mbarara, Kasese, and Masaka. Under PCI 1, the communities reported that 
they are encouraged by NGOs. They are encouraged by their own politicians, religious and cultural leaders, to take advantage of peace and make a good meaning out of it. The communities also express the fear that the Konyi is still alive and is in the neighborhood. This should be the priority. Sometimes the communities tell us, what is the purpose of this classroom block that has been constructed here if our children are not in it? I would like to stop here. If you look at the statistics that was presented here, somebody is going to ask, where is Christian? Where is John? Why are they not there? What is the magic? I want to be very open with you. There are some ministries we feel that uh, the establishment cannot relinquish to any region. For example, infrastructure. There are ministries like health, the security details. Look at the commissioners. Look at who is at uh, the helm of the armed forces. Look at the, uh, the commissioner general prisons, IGP. And what will you tell the rest of the country to feel with you and to feel that Uganda is for all of us? I think uh, in terms of navigating through the corridors of power uh, and the power dynamics in the current state of Uganda. So you'll find those who are very powerful and very, very comfortable. They are here. Small, but uh, they are very powerful and very, very comfortable. And then, of course, there are those who are uncomfortable. So in this alliance of the comfortable, you are powerful, very comfortable, and down there you have the powerless, but very comfortable. So this is an alliance uh, struck by those uh, in power authority. It doesn't matter, they are Karimujong, they are Choli, they are West Nilas, they are, so it doesn't take the, the divide. Whether you are in Karamoja or you are in West Nile or you are in Kisoro, our people are going to the health center with an excess book of 48 pages. Uh, I think some are Kasuku, I don't know, these, these hmm? so they don't have even a medical form. My brothers, my sisters, it doesn't matter which part of Uganda you come from when you come to these realities on the ground. I think this is a very important moment for the people of Uganda. We have to do a lot of reflection on ourselves as the citizens of this country. My name is Kapson Sausi, as introduced from Safer World. In 2013, we conducted a study to help us understand the land conflict issues because um, we are not uh, based in the north then, and for us to claim any strength in working on these issues, we needed to be grounded uh, through a thorough study. So the study focused on the nature and extent of land conflicts in uh, northern Uganda. Basic to note here is that uh, we found out that 69% of the districts of the political northern Uganda face land conflict. The issuance of customary certificates, can this answer all the questions? How else can customary tenure holders be encouraged to remember and file the evidence of the transactions? Absentee landlords, what's the importance of all this land that we can't use because the owner is in the UK, is in Kampala, or elsewhere? How can land rights holders maximize the benefits that land provides for development and poverty alleviation. People need to know their rights under customary law. The government should increase budget allocation to land governance issues. Uh, people need a lower cost to be able to register uh, their pieces of land. And uh, there are quite a number. A conflict-sensitive and rights-based approach to all resource land interventions must be employed, ensuring transparency, community participation, and public oversight. The ministry is working on strengthening security of tenure and enhancing access to land. The ministry is supposed to issue 800,000 certificates of customary ownership 
600 communal land associations are to be uh, incorporated, and then 100,000 peri-urban parcels of land are to be demarcated in those areas. When this is done, it should go a long way to arrest the situation of conflicts, especially uh, over boundaries and what? And ownership. And then we are looking at possibilities ha of having uh, local investment, then a uh, family entering into a nucleated settlement arrangement, and then also they can engage a foreign investor. The reconciliation of ownership and use into a single legal entity is the basis for shifting peasants from subsistence sector to commercial farming by enabling them to possess the land which they use. When we talk about uh, land, there is the whole question of class struggle. Who is exploiting who? And if you talk about development, you talk about investment, you ask yourself, development for who? You say, we want to bring you development. You are idle using your land, but development for who? Let's take example of Amoro and uh, Najumani. You see the problem with Uganda is that we always tribalize this, this district boundaries. I want to give you an example of APA. I personally part participated in it. APA is not a tribal thing. A tri APA is a conflict between three different, uh, between Amoro district administration, between Ajumani district administration, and between wildlife. When I traveled to Mbarara, people tell you there is development, but there is land grabbing. Because the rich are buying the hills. When you go to, to Western Uganda, you just ask, whose hill is that one? Now, how can we not have a policy to regulate how much an individual can own a piece of land? How can one go and buy 10 square kilometers and you allow him to go and buy another 10 square kilometers? The compendium captures and reflects people's own narrative of their lived experiences, as Chris said, as well as their perception on peace, justice, and nation building. So it's neither an indictment on the individuals who are mentioned, given Chris's explanation again on how people remember this, nor a factual account of the experiences that were shared. To the contrary, we think the compendium demonstrates how polarized Ugandans are with impartial and incomplete recollection of past events. The audit was a participatory research process conducted in 20 districts. And the 20 districts we're talking about, if you look at the map of Uganda, at the moment we have about 112 districts. But we took the map of the 1980s and we took five districts that existed at that time. The audit sought to comprehensively map out past and ongoing conflicts and their legacies, as well as outstanding accountability and reconciliation issues in Uganda by doing the following. One, documenting in these districts from a community perspective all armed conflict experiences by the, the affected communities, as well as those whose legacies remain unaddressed. That was our first objective. The second was to identify and assess the outstanding accountability and reconciliation, what we often call transitional justice issues that are related to these conflicts. And finally, we wanted to identify and network with key stakeholders, many of whom are represented here today, including civil society organization and communities that were working on transitional justice related issues. Um, the main question uh, we posed our participants uh, was, do you think there is peace in Uganda? And what surfaced was all the different conflicts that are outlined in the compendium and that we will take you through in summary form uh, this morning. Uh, I, will also, I also make a quick reference to the poster that uh, Ola showed to you. 
the campaign poster stating peace, stability and security, making a reference to 28 different uh, rebel groups that were indeed pacified, which already reveals that peace is a relative conflict. We can say that yes, we have some form of peace as compared to maybe 30 years ago, as compared to uh, neighboring countries. But every single participant we asked, do you think is, there is peace in Uganda, said no. We think there's no peace in Uganda. There's different, uh, there's different divisions at all different levels uh, in society. So the discussion around national reconciliation and transitional justice has been going on for, for many years, almost 10 years. It uh, originated primarily during the Juba peace talks and was later continued uh, both by civil society and by, gov uh, by government, uh, for example, under the justice law and order sector. By now, there's a, a complete consensus that there's a very important, urgent need for reconciliation and for a transitional justice process on a national level rather than on a, a regional level, focusing on, for example, just uh, on northern Uganda. That is a discourse we have overcome and that we have moved beyond. I've listened to your deliberations over this last day and a half as carefully as I possibly could. And I've learned a great deal. And I thank you for allowing me to be part of that discussion. Let me begin by stating the obvious. And the obvious is that I am not a Ugandan. I am a South African and I am an African by ancestry, by birth and by conviction. I have spent some time over the last years trying to understand northern Uganda. I'm reluctant to say that I will ever be able to fully understand. But as I look at Africa and as I understand Africa, I need to remind you that there is a very narrow line between a victim and a perpetrator. It's easy to use this event to further vent our anger. It's easy to use this event to undermine the reconciliation process. But we are also saying there is a relationship, an inherent relationship between justice or accountability and reconciliation. So what do we do and how do we handle this? I want to suggest reconciliation is going one step further. It's to say we are going to try to the extent that it's possible, and he has that word again, to understand the other. You don't have to love somebody. You don't have to embrace somebody. You don't have to kiss somebody. You don't have to marry somebody in order to have peace. Reconciliation, I am suggesting to you, is on the boundary between exclusion and embracing. The ICC has indicted Joseph Kony, and the Americans have drones. They can find anybody anywhere on earth, but they can't find Mr. Kony. I want to suggest that if the International Criminal Court does not take the critique of Africa seriously, the International Criminal Court will die a slow and insignificant death. Thank you. Now, in our hurry for independence, in all absence we wanted independence, let this bazungu get off our backs. President Kenyatta now demised, President Nyerere now demised, President Obote now demised, agreed that instead of getting independence on different days, they would get it on one day. There were the white highlanders the, in Kenya who were very powerful. The people in Mango said, look, if we go into this federation, what will be the stake of our 
Kabaka. If Uganda goes into this federation, we are not part of it. Ekitibwa Chabuganda has been violated since 1962. I'm saying this openly. Because I ran into Professor Dan Namdere before his death in the Church Hill Hotel in Hulu, and he had gone along with his good friend, uh, a work a work Tibwa Dan Mulika, who had been Katikro of Uganda, saying that since 1962, Uganda has had no constitution. We must have a new constitution conference. My president, Yoweri Kagutem Seven, will wake up one morning and say, look, these Ugandans have suffered enough. What was this thing? Justice James Ogola was talking about that it is in the pipeline. Let us dust this bill, pass it, and let there be a national reconciliation, truth-telling commission and a, a council, and a meeting of parliament whether it's a constituent assembly, whatever. I think that for us to be able to put into account what uh, the professor gave us, particularly the postulates that he gave us that uh, are a prerequisite to genuine uh, national reconciliation, which involved management and resolving of conflict, and also um, bringing in a participatory manner the actors, the various actors, the victims, and those um, that are on the other side of the debate to be able to speak to one another openly and transparently. Issues of truth-telling, accountability and acknowledgement, issues of reparations, issues of uh, memorialization, democratic participation, and then the dialogue that he mentioned. These are remain fundamental elements that we need to. If we are to generate a framework for transitional justice in this country. We need to ensure that these um, elements are properly included into it. I want to say that um, as a country, we have not come, whereas we've experienced a number of conflicts, about 29 of them, Professor, here, uh, since independence. We have not come up with a clear national policy for conflict prevention, management, and resolution. I personally do not think that we should do with the ICC because this is one of the ways we can tame errant leadership. People who do things with impunity because they, they can be untouchable. The question before us is, are there conflicts that this country has not addressed itself to that continue to bedevil our land? And I guess what would be expected of me is to look at the chronicle of conflicts identified in this book and be able to look back and do a kind of an audit and say, which ones of these have we addressed and which ones of these have we not? I like to argue, as I sat and listened to the presentation both of the history and the cross-cutting issues that which Anlike presented to us, as to what are the issues in each of these conflicts that we observe. I hope by now there is consensus in this room that as a country, we have not even begun to address any of these. That, for me, is my sense. And I would like to argue that the fault lines lie in the leadership processes, and I will be arguing that this is much, much more rooted in a long history that I believe we need to address ourselves to. So let me say this. I would like to submit that the seven, or what their number is, the cross-cutting issues, if you check on the contents, I think they are very well articulated in the contents on, uh, I think it must be page uh, Roman 7, Roman 7, you will see uh, the uh, chapter 2. First of all, the cross-cutting thematic issues that were identified as the areas of conflict, um, uh, the colonial uh, question, post-independence, north-south division, and all the others that outlined, and then the historical uh, 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 trajectory uh, of those conflicts. I like myself to suggest that all those listed 
in chapter 2, the cross-cutting issues, could simply be put under two or three broad categories. The first is to do with the nature of the state. The point, I think, has been made that we inherited a predator state. That the colonial state in its construction was never intended to be for the people. That what you have is we were invaded by plunderers. Do you remember the first owners of this country was the Imperial British East African Company? In other words, Uganda was a commodity on sale. What else has followed is simply the outcome of a state so constructed. So remember, as it has been well articulated to us, the colonial state was for the colonizers. Effectively built to serve that purpose. For how many years? Since 1894 to 1862. How many years is that? A very long period. Rather than those post-independence leaders setting on a course, and I think this is something very unique about this country. I think there were attempts in other countries to actually try and get to reconstruct the state for the state to work for the people. Show me any efforts to transform education in this country. We still have the foundations of our education set up is completely clear. It is colonial. In fact, right now, a much poorer version of it. I can still remember President Museveni speaking to us. I was a student at Makerere University, and he gave us a public lecture on what the root problems of this country were. And he argued very convincingly then, as a younger lad, fairly inexperienced, hadn't read very much, that problem number one was the army. That the army was not national. May I ask the question? This transformation of the national army, does it feel national? Thank you very much. Now that bishops are talking politics, perhaps we, the lay people, can preach. My, I'm a grandson of a, a lay Anglican preacher. I never pursued his line, so I'm not ordained. But perhaps today we can reflect on the things which have been said over the last two days and connect it to what we saw today. We are here saying national reconciliation is the answer. What is the question? Probably I'm the only one here who has ever run for president in this room, in this country. At least I don't see anybody else. The Honorable Mayanjang Kanji is not around. He would have been the other one. And I want to share with you my personal experience as I went to places in Luero Triangle. When I visited the district of Nakaseke, and I'm very proud of my origins, I don't think the purpose of this meeting is for us to renounce our origins. I think we all have an origin. Even when you go to America, people will say, I'm from Texas. Today I had lunch with a gentleman who says, I'm from Bavaria and he's a German. I, I don't think that has been a problem. Even Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth. So how do we uproot the seeds of hatred? I think that is the question that we have got to answer. Because seeds of hatred, like all seeds, are planted. I am not the one who courted my mother for my father. I am just what I am. Why should I qualify for every job except being president of Uganda? Should I believe in that kind of country? I think I have a fairly good brain. I'm very highly educated. I have been to some of the best universities in the world, including the universities where people like Clinton, both Hillary and Bill went, Yale University. Now I want to be the commander-in-chief 
and chief executive of the country, and all of a sudden my tribe is an obstacle. What's the difference between my country and Sudan, where to be president you must be an Arab and a Muslim? And the South Sudanese said, we are designing our own flag, we are going to design our own national anthem, let's be neighbors rather than being in the same country. Let me tell you the delegations that went to the Nairobi Peace Talks. You have heard President Museveni talking about Bantu phone and Nilophone. This is a head of state. General Tito Kelo, chairman of the military council and head of state. Honorable Abraham Waligo, prime minister and minister of finance. Paul Kawanga Semogerere, minister of internal affairs. Brigadier Fred Okecho, member of military council. I hope you can see the clear dividing line. You know, Cain and Abel started the conflict also. And God asked Cain, where is your brother? I am not my brother's keeper. Esau was cheated. And you know when somebody cheats you, when I talk to Ambassador Olarotunu, he's very angry that President Museveni went and signed an agreement in Nairobi, then came and overthrew them. For me to go and give Joseph Kony a hug, do you know how much I thought about it? I have a very famous picture where I'm hugging Kony, hugging Ivo itself. I'm now inviting all of us who are here to start practicing what we preach here, to remove the log from our eyes before pointing out the specks of dust from other people's eyes. God bless you all. I will remind you of the subject that is being discussed by a panel, which is what role can political parties and their leadership play in promoting national unity and reconciliation. That's what we are supposed to discuss here, but I think the presenters went and said other ah, many things and did not say much on that, on that subject. So I will just make my critique for, in relation to that subject. It would be an uphill task for the political parties to play that role of unity, uniting, and reconciling Ugandans. I went into politics to change Uganda for better. Down the road, I was betrayed. The parties, I want to assert the parties and their leaders must be driven by people's interest. I used to hear in the discussion, my father used to bring news home and he used to reduce the, 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 the reduction of the manifestos of these parties were like this to us. She was briefing my mother that she may go and vote. An RIM party stole the movement. You people, people don't know that. They, they deceived people in the... All of us were in the movement with Semogere here. All of us, he, she, he went there before me, in fact. And, and, and <laughs> then the movement kept narrowing down, narrowing down, narrowing down. By that time, actually, we went into the so-called political parties. It was a real one party. But the people down there in the public thought that we all belonged there. Now, when they came to register as a party, they stole the movement, the, and the Constitution was saying, when we go into Marit Party, the movement system should go in abeyance. Me, Miriam Atembe, I have been here. I'm a very distinguished person of integrity. Glory to God by the grace of God. But which parties are, are wooing me? They even fear to woo me because they know I will tell them this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. Eh? So I tell them, you have not wooed me. Who is wooing me? I'm at large. I can even give them a leadership that is of integrity and accepted by Ugandans. But they are there. They don't know that. So in conclusion, the political parties are not capable of playing the role of promoting unity and reconciliation in Uganda. We first need conducive political environment where they can operate, 
And then we need restructuring of the political parties to make them people-centered and service-oriented. Otherwise, they have nowhere to begin and to end because do we trust them to accept them to unite us? Thank you very much for your time. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, praise be to thee, the cherished and sustain of the worlds. I am here to represent His Eminence, the Mufti of Uganda, Sheikh Shaban Ramadan Mubadje. Building peace is one of the most difficult tasks for human beings. Let us not be short-sighted and not, let us not be driven by the odds of the day. The Islamic understanding of paradise, which we aspire for in the hereafter, is based on peace. In fact, paradise is called Dar Salaam, the abode of peace. Peace is such a central notion to Islam that the very greeting among the people of paradise is peace, or Salaam. I, I, I listen to uh, our venerable speakers here, and um, the thing is about governance. And uh, I have heard in the past people talk about three arms of government. That is the executive, there is the judiciary, and there is the, the, the legislature. I am very happy and appreciate that the, the, the judiciary has been with us in this endeavor of reconciliation since we started. But the executive, well, now the the parliament, members of parliament are here. I wanted to think that as we discuss these things, by the time we end, if each one of us, because I know all of these groups have a role, or they have roles which are defined clearly, but if it has been missing, whether you are a cultural leader, whether you are a religious leader, whether you are a parliamentarian, whether you are in the judiciary, whether you are in the executive, there are clear roles spelled out for you. But if the area of reconciliation is me missing, then I would wish and would ask that you go back and include it in or among your roles in your respective cocoon, and then address it. Because if we began a journey between, from 16th March of this year onwards, we need to address that specifically. So that that role is seen and handled at the level that you are. We have priests, but sometimes we need to know that we have prophetic priests and functional priests. There are priests who merely do conduct the rituals, but they don't know that we have our role. When Moses was given the law to lead the children of Israel out, he was doing priestly as well as political leadership. Come to David himself. He had a political role, but also he had a priestly function. Then the Lord Jesus himself, when he came, he said, I have not come to change, but to improve and refine. So our duty during our own generation, like we are talking now, should be to understand those who have the gift of prophetic, the prophetic message. Let them take, I really want to appreciate my bishop. Yesterday when he stood here under the president of the Democratic Party, you know, there is a way he puts it. He said, if the bishop is doing politics, I will preach. And actually, he, he preached very effectively. The colonial administration alienated especially land from the indigenous tribes. And then, through taxation, changed our mode of life from nomadic pastoralism and shifting cultivation to a settled way of life. So people started owning land, land that they called Vibanja. And people were confined, confined in areas, small areas, so that it was easy for the, uh, for the colonial administrators to collect tax, because then they would be able to locate you. The role of cultural institutions in taming this situation can be found in the Bible books of one, 
Lamentations 1, chap, uh, Lamentations 1, verse 1, and Exodus 20, verses 1 to 17, and also Matthew chapters 5, 5, 1, through 6 to 7, 29. Now, it is a history of commonalities and coexistence of man and, sorry, man and man and of man and nature. A history with no battles of Trafalgar, Waterloo, Boston Tea Party, Kabamba 1 and Kabamba 2. Of youths besieging military strongholds with knives and pangas. Now, the books of Ex Exodus and Matthew center on interpersonal relations love for each other. Cultural institutions are all about cultural ident identity through establishing various cultural, established cultural values and traditions. The natural law as against the legal law. Natural law is dynamic but evolutionary. So while legal law sustains pragmatic and revolution, sorry, while legal law, uh, while legal law uh, is sudden, pragmatic, and revolutionary. The motto of cultural institutions is slow but sure, while the one of legal law is the end justifies the means for God and my country. I wanted to ask who should reconcile, reconcile with who? It seems conflicts are everywhere. Conflicts are in the church. Conflicts are in the, in the government, in the parliament, in the executive. People were reshuffled recently from big ministries to small ministries. Conflicts are everywhere. We have looked at the historical background of this country, change of regimes. We saw how people were making their submissions here. I was very touched when I listened to Honorable, my brother, Honorable Dick Nyai. He wa, when he was submitting, he even shed tears. In fact, I, I, I found myself also shedding tears, really. The Bible says you, you forgive many times. Really, if you are offending me today, I forgive you. Tomorrow you offend me, I forgive you. The next day you offend me. I forgive you. Why can't you stop offending me? I, I was uh, chatting with the Professor Latigo here and Regan, and people were taking pictures. Say, you see this Prime Minister of Tor? The other day when I hosted the Honorable Mama and Babazi, it, it became an issue in Tor. It became an issue. And yet the man was the Prime Minister. We invited him in good faith. But it has become a very big problem for me. So anyway, let us forgive, but even those who are, who, are, who are forgiven, please check. Don't keep offending people and you expect them to forgive you all the time, all the time. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>